I, I wanted to propose that uh, both resentment and uh, forgiveness somehow go beyond knowledge. Um, it, they go to a place where emotions and traumatic memories cannot be reduced to linear narrative and historical knowledge. Um, so if you take the two central authors that think about these issues, Jacques Derrida, who wrote about forgiveness, and then Jeanne Marie, who is the most important speaker uh, on resentment, you will see that both of these writers are interested um, in the kind of encounter with uh, normally the perpetrator uh, that is not satisfied with only knowledge. But they don't dismiss knowledge. That is, knowledge is necessary, but we have to go beyond. And so let's uh, just start with Jeanne Amery and his argument in favor of knowledge before we, we go to the beyond. Uh, so he, he thinks that knowledge enables people to construe subjectivity, right? and to somehow make meaningful um, catastrophes that normally defy uh, experience and understanding. So, uh, subjectivity may be reconstructed when the victim can freely and independently use language. And um, after years of dehumanization, uh, the victims of the Holocaust, this is where he comes from, but it is also true of South Africa, um, these victims regain their voice and they are allowed to tell their own story using their own words. Um, and it is from the position, therefore, of authority because they are the uh, addressers. The victims were glad to have a voice that could influence the decision making of administrations in the aftermath of disaster. Um, they regained a sense of autonomy, right? So this was the most important thing. They were allowed to insist on the fact that as victims they can tell a story that the perpetrator wants to eliminate from history, right? So they want to preserve these events as historical narratives. The victims felt that they embodied privileged knowledge to which the, to which the perpetrators have no access. Uh, so the ability to share this knowledge seemed both historically valuable and emotionally therapeutic. So here the victims stress that the perpetrator has to be punished based on their testimonies and has to also be re-educated. The crimes that were committed must not be forgotten. Amélie suggests that the crimes of the Holocaust must become and this is a quote, a negative possession of the German culture forever. Um, Jacques Derrida also values knowledge. He's the, the one who speaks about forgiveness because he thinks that processes of judgment, reconciliation, transitional justice, peace, and nation building occur within the limits of language and knowledge but they do not reach the heights of forgiveness. So the political and diplomatic efforts of reconciliation become moral because they are bracketed within the ethics of forgiveness. Okay? So knowledge is needed in both cases, and yet both Derrida and Amri address the fact that forgiveness and resentment go beyond knowledge to a personal and historical realm of traumatic events that cannot be reduced to narrative and that disable the institution of coherent mm -hmm. subjectivity. Um, for Derrida, pure forgiveness is a paradox. He demands that forgiveness forgive only the unforgivable crimes. Um, this paradoxical requirement means that both forgiveness and the refusal to forgive are mad and cannot be understood by a third party. And yet, in psychoanalysis, literature, film, and the arts, such a paradox is illuminating and rife with 
consequences. The person who becomes capable of wrestling with ghosts that emerge from memories of the catastrophe and at the same time express the need of a new beginning for herself and for the world um, is strong. It's a strong presence in history and in culture, even though this subject is split and addresses us from within notions and ideas that she cannot fully articulate. Yeah, um, so it's really in the same vein, right? We're mm -hmm. continuing kind of in the same vein. So I can say that literature, film, psychoanalysis, and even philosophy, it's mm -hmm. true, um, they give us access to traumatic events that cannot be reduced to knowledge. And I am thinking specifically about novels and works that, um, um, that are related to the Holocaust and to the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa, but also to uh, um, Aboriginal people in Australia. There's a lot of literature uh, and film related to this issue that uh, I'm addressing. So I will give you just one example, right? There is uh, Heinrich Böll. He's a German writer who received the Nobel Prize of Literature. And so he is addressing the question of resentment. He creates a protagonist who's a professional clown. This is his job. And this is in order to expose how fraudulent and hypocritical repentance is in Germany after the Second World War. Um, and to show that the clown who is devoted to social and historical resentment um, brings to the fore a traumatic state of mind that is closer to the personal and the historical truths that were left behind when the war ended and Germany was interested mostly in rebuilding its economy. Right? So literature has to somehow access all this repressed uh, personal and historical uh, material. Um, and, and the clown can do this um, when he is when he's playing, right, with all the other characters. In South Africa, we have uh, Kutsi, and he's fashioning a protagonist who is accused of raping a student. So uh, the university offers that he ask for forgiveness in the presence of a committee of his peers, but he refuses to do this, right? At the same time, he so he's fired. At the same time, he is asking uh, uh, for forgiveness in a family dinner with the student's parents. So uh, the paradox tells the readers that forgiveness is valuable only when it cannot be fully assimilated and construed the way knowledge is assimilated and construed by committees. He refuses the committees, but he will do it on a personal basis. Um, forgiveness remains troubling uh, both when it is refused and when it is granted. In a film, uh, it's called Phoenix by Christian Petzold, the contemporary German director, he shows that there is nothing the protagonist, Nelly, wants more than to lie to herself that her husband did not turn her to the Gestapo. Um, without her love of her husband, Nelly would never have survived Auschwitz. And yet she found out that Johnny, the husband, um, traded her to the Nazis in return for his own life. Uh, so despite the fact that Nelly must forgive her husband's unforgivable acts, she comes out of this paradox as a liberated woman um, who can leave her husband behind and seek her own place in the history of culture um, and culture of Germany after the war. So these are just examples where the subject is never fully, uh, never fully regains autonomy and uh, a straightforward story. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is those uh, ins and outs, right, the, the fall into something that's inexpressible. Um, and this would be valuable in, in the second question.
So the 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 novels and the films um, and they could also be documentary. They don't only have to be fictional, even though I try to work with fictional, but also documentary and also works of visual arts, right? Paintings um, and video art. So um, a, a great deal of classical psychoanalytical texts and philosophical texts, I, I need all these materials when I work. And these are materials that I obtain the way we obtain knowledge, right? Because these materials themselves are to be found in uh, libraries and on the internet and in research institutes all over the world. Um, but I also collect materials from museums and archives of testimonies. And in addition, I try to follow kind of the current daily journalism uh, just uh, to see if there are new articles related to questions of forgiveness, resentment, and oftentimes reconciliation in conflict areas mm. all over the world. And also, of course, um, I always need to check new surveys and polls about um, the value, how people feel about forgiveness, resentment, truth, in the aftermath of all these processes, diplomatic processes. Uh, are they in favor of forgiveness? Are they still uh, um, holding grudges and what kind of resentments they have? Um, so when it is possible, I do use historical uh, footage and I use protocols of committees and testimonies. Um, and of course debates that are related to these uh, commissions. But the only reason that I am mentioning this mm -hmm. is is to kind of add the most important thing that I did not mention until now. Um, it is that these sources that include reports, testimonies, protocols, and sometimes even judgments, mm -hmm. are subject to reading, rereading, contestation, appeal, and probably most important, um, interpretation. Right? So the fact that different authorities can access texts um, that are presumed to be knowledge and they reread them in order to justify new arguments mm -hmm. for reconciliation or in order to give new meaning to practices of forgiveness and new reasons for resentment. This means that knowledge can help us to keep the memories alive, active, and dynamic, right? So knowledge can also fall back into memory because it's never or should never be just fossilized. And so, for example, the TRC knew the Holocaust and could speak a new language in relation to crimes against humanity. Right? Um, whereas after the Second World War, punishment was imperative for the TRC, um, the, the transitional justice was a more valuable thing. And so they could move on and use the language of nation building and healing much more easily, even though it's the same kind of crimes. Mm -hmm. Um, it is also important to remember that administrative and political knowledge becomes academic research material. And then all these sources are subject to interpretation. Academic interpretation always exposes the net of power relations and of needs that are manipulated in order to reach agreement between opposing parties. In academic research and in education, documents come closer to the human beings that were there in the beginning. So in academic research and in education, interpretation allows us to keep abstraction at bay and rethink what the original victims really hoped for when they gave testimony, when they agree to reconciliation, or when they demand a right to resent the perpetrator. So these interpretations can again turn traumatic memories to a suggestion for dynamic communication, even if this kind of conversation is riddled with holes, because it is uh, based on repression and anxiety 
in relation to both the past mm -hmm. and the future. Right, so literature and the arts um, are, are not a substitute to historical research, right? Mm -hmm. um, but without them, uh, without these kind of, of texts, um, uh, so I think history and the human mind cannot become living organisms, really, um, that appeal to the imagination and thereby to real human emotions. Mm -hmm desires and fantasies. So I think it is mostly through our contact with artificial fabrication of metaphor and characters that we are able to access melancholy, loss, envy, and hatred, but also, of course, hope, love, and happiness. Because all these states of mind are related to our desire or the loss of this desire and to the fantasies that we have when we seek to change our lives and achieve what we miss in order to be more accomplished and satisfied human beings. So satisfaction is based on pragmatic, psychoanalytical and ethical premises. And these are the basic components of every literary work and of um, every other artistic production. The metaphorical quality of art is similar to the metaphoric quality of dreams mm. that haunt us at night. Dreams insist to be reified. I'm using here the language of the Jewish uh, writer Bruno Schultz. So uh, this means that what is only a metaphor in our lives wants to become a reality mm. because we uh, um, fulfill our wishes when we satisfy our desire in both pragmatic and ethical senses. A literary text or a work of art can posit desirable emotional and ethical states that become a model for the reader the way historical or cultural knowledge is a model to emulate. From literature and the arts we learn to desire. Um, it's from these fictional texts that we learn to fantasize. We learn to resist, we learn not to settle for reality because reality is always in the process of making and the reader is a potential maker of her own reality. Without fictions, we cannot understand the fictional quality of reality and the fact that reality is never given to us as finalized. Yet literature also teaches us that in reality we are subject to power constellations that must be known and mastered. Only from the position of both knowledge and desire, the subject could change her position in reality and thereby change the reality of her life as a member of the family and the nation. So I think this is kind of why literature is outside and relevant. Wonderful. Thank you so much.